Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to join us on the Retrofit stage. This afternoon's session, we're looking at the social housing retrofit programs and case studies linked to the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. I've, um, I'm representing a panel of fantastic speakers. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Ariana Sade, who is an architect, researcher and sustainability expert. She'll be looking at some of the project work that she's done in the past, which has been the forerunner for what we see as SHDF now. We've got Joanne Hiscott, strategic asset manager from Moat Homes. Joanne's going to speak to us about the bid process and preparing for SHDF. And then finally, we've got Adam Masters, Assistant Director of Environment and Sustainability at Stonewater. Adam's going to look at the SHDF Wave 1 projects that he's been involved in and delivery uh, as, a, uh, as a case study. So, fantastic range of, uh, of uh, knowledge, a real kind of narrative through the journey of social housing decarbonisation. And um, without further delay, I'll hand over. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. Right. Um, today I'm going to share with you some lessons from large-scale social housing retrofit, opportunities, risks, and challenges. Um, buildings constructed today will be there for the next 50 to 100 years. For example, 92% of the building stock from 2005 will still be there in 2020 and 75% in 2050. This is a quote from the EU in 2008. And newly constructed buildings are more energy efficient, but 80% of buildings in 2050 have already been built. So a major priority is decarbonizing our existing stock uh, from the UK GBC this year. I'm Marianna Stey, an architect, research and sustainability specialist. I have worked for 15 years in housing, uh, on retrofit and new build. My talk today will be about the I4 project, Innovation for Renewal, that I worked on between 2010 and 2015, when I was a research fellow at the University of Brighton. I have done a PhD on retrofit and climate change, uh, and uh, uh, I currently work uh, uh, as a sustainability design advisor for the DFE, but I'm not representing my employer here. I'm talking about the IFO project and the social housing project I worked on uh, when I was a research fellow. Um, I'm going to speak for 15 minutes, uh, and I will appreciate your questions at the end of the talk in the Q&A session. So a brief uh, summary of the presentation. I'll talk about the I4 project, the project location, policy background and the aim of the project, the house types, modeling results, uh, interventions, innovations, overeating and retrofit, occupants engagement and monitoring. The IFO project. The IFO was a six million research project funded by the EU, uh, Interreg the funding, regional development fund. Uh, was led by the University of Brighton uh, with an academic partner in France, the University of Artois, and two housing associations, one in England, Amicus Horizon, and one in France, Pas de Calais Habitat. 100 houses are in Rushenden on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent, and 100 houses are in Utro in the region of Pas de Calais. I led the modeling uh, and evaluation work packages, and this project won several awards in both countries, including a large scale retrofit award. But the policy background. Um, in 2009, the Climate Change Act set up the legally binding target to reduce by 80% the carbon emissions of the UK by 2050, compared to 1990's baseline. Um, in 2019, the Act was upgraded 
to um, include a reduction to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, when this project started in 2010, uh, the target was still to reduce by 80% um, the carbon emissions. And the, the, strategies was, uh, the strategy was to reduce by 60% the emissions with physical measures. And, um, and the further 20% reduction would be brought in by uh, a change in the occupant's behavior. Um, which is the most difficult to achieve, but also the most effective, and it is necessary when we work on existing buildings. Occupants need to get used to the new technologies, the new systems that they've got in their houses. Um, and here you can see that the English housing stock is smaller than the French housing stock, but in percentage, the social housing sector is, is bigger 17% in England against 14% in France. So this is very relevant in terms of working with the social housing sector and how that can bring forward innovation and change. Now, there are seven house types in England, quite similar in their construction, built between 1945 and 55, brick and block, cavity wall, single and two-story houses. The EPC was band E before the retrofit, so very inefficient. In France, the house types were very different, um, and the EPC rate as well was better, uh, so um, the energy performance was um, slightly better, but uh, they have a different way to calculate it. That's some, something that also we need to take into account. Um, some insulation had already been installed in the houses in England uh, using funding from the Community Energy Saving Program, CESP, and the Carbon Emissions Reduction Target, CERT, the precursors of the SHDF. A layer of loft insulation and cavity insulation had already been installed. And thermographic photos, however, showed that there were large areas of water penetration and their leakage around the windows and doors. Um, the model simulated an improved roof, walls, and windows view values. The air permeability that was simulated in the modeling was uh, three uh, cubic meter per square meter per hour. And that was achieved after the retrofit in some of the single-story houses. Uh, this is a list of the interventions that were modeled using dynamic thermal simulation. Starting from a base case, the base case is the building as it stands. Cavity wall and loft insulation were omitted from the base case because of software constraints. Um, so case, case one includes cavity wall and a top up of the loft insulation together with the external wall insulation. Case two incl includes the measures installed in case one plus something else, uh, plus the replacement of the windows. Case three, as above, plus air tightness improvement. Uh, case 4A, is case three plus supplier windows that I will explain a little bit later. And case 4B, instead of the supplier windows, includes an MVHR. So from the modeling results, we see that the single most effective measure to reduce emissions is the insulation with 33% reduction, followed by the combination of air tightness improvement and MVHR and um, at 19%, and the air tightness improvement on its own at um, 16%. The, um, this is just an example uh, of modeled interventions, because the order in which these interventions are modeled uh, will change the relative energy reduction of each intervention. That's the list of interventions that have been installed in France. Um, loft insulation top up, external wall insulations, um, windows refurbishment, door replacement, draft proofing, ventilation, 
and VHR in the two-story houses and mechanical extra ventilation in the two-story houses and, and VHR in the single-story houses. It's the other way around. Replacement of existing aerated boilers and some renewable energy systems. Air source pumps, ground source pumps, where possible, PV panels, solar thermal. And some innovations that were integral part of this project. Supplier windows, trom walls, and um, in some prototype houses. These are the interventions that were installed in France. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in France, the housing association had decided to hire an architect to design a prototype panelized overcladding system that contained the insulation made of recycled uh, fabric and uh, new supplier windows. So these prefabricated panels were manufactured locally uh, in a local factory in France and uh, in Padicale that we went to visit. And, um, uh, and um, these prefabricated panels currently minimize some of the thermal bridging that actually were present in the houses in England because no detailing was done. And this is a shortfall um, and a lesson that we've learned after, after this project and that was incorporated in past 2035. Um, they also installed in France new loft insulation. Et voila, supplier windows. These are triple glazed or double glazed windows that use the gap between the windows, between the glass panes, to preheat the air uh, with the solar radiation and ventilate the rooms with warmer air. The system runs in combination with mechanical extract and we actually made it work with MVHR in England. And these were manufactured by a French manufacturer called uh, Ridoré, uh, and they are included in their catalog. A lot of modeling was done by the University of Artois to understand the mechanism of the airflow within these windows. Um, this is the overcladding panelized system that was prototyped in France and installed in the single story houses in France. Um, as part of uh, my doctorate, I have modeled solar shading and ventilation in these houses that were retrofitted in England and um, to understand what the impact of these two systems, methods to reduce the energy consumption is uh, in reducing or increasing the overheating risk of these houses, you know, in terms of whether by 2050 or 2080 when the climate will change and we have got predictions that it will be warmer and wetter in some circumstances, what will, will happen to these houses and whether the, if the retrofit will be beneficial or, or actually uh, cause more problems in the future. Um, so um, the, the use of solar shading and shutters and trees and blinds is very beneficial. It's important to expose the thermal mass, provide cross ventilation, which is essential. Uh, no, ventil no insulation without ventilation, especially in summer. In summer, the more ventilation, uh, the better. And actually, the two strategies to reduce overheating are ventilation and shading. And uh, I've done some modeling, and uh, the results were that insulation reduces the overheating risk up to 2080, but the air tightness increases it. So the, the key is to increase the ventilation in summer. Um, this is some engagement. Uh, engagement activities run in both countries. They were part, integral part of the project that were written into the project proposal. And in England, the housing association, Amigos Horizon, partnered with Groundwork, um, Federation of Charities that provided green doctors, um, uh, site-based occupants engagement officer, and a school engagement officer. 
The green doctors visited regularly the households that were part of the project, gave advice, um, ran two major questionnaires to understand the behavior before and after the retrofit. The community officer was based permanently in the, com in the community, um, inside the development, and uh, was the point of reference for the queries of uh, the residents that came uh, to ask what was the uh, technology installed and how that worked, etc. And then there was a school engagement officer that ran talks and activities with the local schools, believing that by educating the children that they could then pass it on to their parents and educate the, the grown-ups as well. Um, presented the project and discussed how to save energy and preserve the environment, which was a very important key of this, um, of this project. <clears throat> so the project engaged with 20 local, 20 local schools in Russian then, 145 children were involved, the detective games and breakfast clubs were formed. Uh, the project involved the scouts with the ideas of giving energy budgets. Uh, overall, 1,034 people were involved in the community and 16 volunteers and consultation groups were formed. Um, the houses were monitored during uh, the project with data loggers for temperature and relative humidity. Smart heating controls and equipment to monitor renewable energy systems were installed um, to measure as well the heating and the electricity uh, use in these houses. Uh, the household in France were given a tablet um, that um, provided by Intent, uh, Intent Technology, uh, the manufacturer of these tablets. Uh, that gives instant readings of the energy use and enabled the occupants to get an education about how much energy they were used and uh, how to reduce that. They were also trained to use the tablet so that they could uh, slowly learn how to adopt a low carbon lifestyle. The temperature readings in the graph uh, um, at the top uh, were recorded before and after the retrofit of a single story house in Russian then in February. You see the blue line is the temperature for each day in February before the retrofit. The red line is the temperature recording after the retrofit in February. You see that the temperature is much more stable after the retrofit. Uh, around the 20 degree mark. There are no peaks as high uh, as 25 or as low as 15 degrees. And which means that the residents are much more comfortable uh, in their retrofitted homes than they were before. I don't know where to put my tablet with my notes on. So thank you for, for coming this afternoon. Um, my name is Joanne Hiscock and um, I'm the Head of Strategic Asset Management at Moat Housing. So Moat are based in the southeast of England and we cover Kent, Essex, London, Surrey and Sussex. We have over 20,000 homes and just over 12,000 of those are rented. The rest of, the rest of them are shared ownership. So what I'm going to do today is take you through um, a timeline very quickly on our approach before the SHDF funding, because you don't just get, oh, the funding's coming out, you have to do preparation before then. So a lot of you will have known in 2016 to 2022, we had the renewable heat incentive, and um, we used that for mainly air source heat pumps, and that was a great opportunity to fund in. That's now stopped, so we're having to fully fund that. We also was um, able to get some European regional development funding, um, and I'm going to go through that in a moment, which um, we applied for some energy sprung um, properties um, in uh, Malden, which is in Essex. In 2022 to 20, 
2006, there is some ECO4 funding, and we're currently trying to um, get some of that funding, and we're looking at what measures and what properties we can use that against. 2022, obviously, we've got the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, and then in 2023, we're actually um, part of a pilot for HACT. Um, and we're just currently working with them to find out how we can get some funding from them um, against sustainable uh, f from other businesses rather than them going outside and getting funding for an acre of Amazon rainforest. Um, they can give that funding to us. So what was Moat's approach before SHDF? So the first thing we wanted to do uh, when the targets became available that we had to get to um, D by 2025 and then um, EPCC by 2030, we got buy-in from the board and the exec team. So we, need, we did some modeling on how much money it was going to cost us and um, we got the buy-in and they were really committed to us having that funding from, um, from Moat ourselves on how we were gonna achieve that. We also completed some retrofit projects um, over the past four years. So we did Munden Road, um, which was, um, I'm going to show you a picture on my next slide, but Munden Road was in Essex and we did five properties up to an energy sprung level. So we spent a lot of money on these properties. We did air source heat pumps, um, cladding, PV panels, um, and we really made them zero carbon. The bills for those people at the moment are around five pounds a month in the summer. So that was a really big learning curve for us. And what we did is that we couldn't replicate that level of um, funding for that, those properties. But what we did is we took the best bits out of that and we wanted to use that against our other, other stock. We also did a big 25 million pound project in London, which was in Merton, um, called Pollard's Hill. This was um, a 1960s flatted estate and needed a lot of work doing to it. So what we did is that we did um, external wall insulation, uh, we did um, kitchens, bathrooms, um, and we really made, we couldn't put PVs on the, pan, on the roofs, unfortunately, because they were flat roofs, but we tried to make the best of those properties as what we could. And then lastly is, is the data, but I'm gonna talk a bit more about the data in a second. So this was our Munden Road project, which is um, in Malden, um, and we did five of these. We're currently on site now for a further 29 properties in this road, um, and it's, gonna, it's about a million pound project um, to do those other 29 homes. We're not going to the same level. They don't need to have um, EWI on them because they are cavity wall, but we're doing PVs, windows, doors, um, we're working with um, QBOT and we're going to be doing underfloor um, insulation on those as well. So data. Data is really, really important, as you all know. Um, this is our current position that we're in at the moment. So to get to um, all our properties to D rating, it's actually not too bad. We've only got um, just under 200 properties that we need to get up to D by 2025. Now the SHDF funding that we've applied for doesn't necessarily do the, the, e, the E properties um, because we wanted to get the properties as much as we could up to AC. And the ones that are E rated are actually quite low level measures, loft top ups, cavity wall insulations, and they're things that we are actually going to be doing this year as part of that work. We didn't want to not waste our money on from the SHDF funding, um, but we wanted to use it in the best way possible in order to achieve our zero carbon journey. So as I said, we're currently working on the, um, some of the E's that aren't included in the SHDF and we're looking at those, those measures right now. So we should have most of those done by the end of this year, if not next year. So the application, um, <laughs> I don't know how many, how many of you here have actually done an SHDF application? A few, you, yeah. It's, um, it was quite a traumatic experience, um, especially the, the spreadsheets. Um, 
yeah, many sleepless nights um, trying to get those to work. Um, we did feed that back. I hope you fed that back as well. But as part of the application, um, they wanted us to be ambitious. Now, we've got 12,000 homes, uh, just over 12,000 homes, and we, our application that we've put in is for um, 613 homes. So that for us is quite, is, I think, is ambitious. Um, it's going to be a £22 million project, and on that we are funding 60% of it. So we are asking for 40% funding from, from the government. Innovation, innovation. They asked us to be innovative. So um, we looked at digital solutions, um, and we are currently installing, um, as part of a pilot, we're installing Switchy and ACO Homelink into 70 homes, now ready, because as part of the... Um, information to go back to the government you have to show that these measures have worked so we're installing them before the funding so we can get that information ready for um, to go forward so once we've um, we've installed those pilot projects and that's actually going on right now um, we will then award the rest of them to either ACO Homelink or to Switchy um, and that will be every single property will have one of these um, smart sensors in. Now, as you know, with damper mould, that's going to be ever more important. So we're thinking, actually, the government will probably end up making us install these later on down the line. So we might as well do it now. There was um, additional funding available on the SHDF for this. So we've taken advantage of that. Lastly was customer engagement. So... We wanted to do a completely different approach to customer engagement, more than what we had ever done before. So we've changed the language. A lot of our customers see that um, we are doing to them in their homes, and actually want, what we wanted to do was to say to them, no, we are doing this for you. We want your homes warm. We want them energy efficient. That is for you, it is not for us. So we're completely changing how we, uh, we talk to our residents. We're changing our marketing, we're doing videos, we're doing one-to-one -one meetings with them. So we're really putting a big emphasis on, um, on how we engage with them. Um, we've got customer engagement plans, we have, um, which we are talking with comms. We've got them in at the beginning. So they have been with us before even the application um, went in. Um, they were there helping us to get those plans together. Lastly, we submitted the application in November. Um, we were hoping for the bids, and I wasn't sure how this presentation was going to go because we'd have heard um, that whether we were successful or not, then I might have put a slightly different stance on this. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're waiting now for um, the, app, the, the announcements. Um, and if anyone saw on my LinkedIn, I was like, come on, come on, just let us know. Um, but we haven't stopped. So even though the applications went in, we didn't just stop there and we're not waiting for the announcement. We're already looking at procurement. We're getting ahead of the curve, the customer engagement plan. We have a governance board where um, the I chair that we um, meet every month. So we're all still in the planning phase and we haven't just stopped. So thank you. Um, if you've got any questions, please ask them afterwards. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to run through some case studies from Stonewater's perspective. So we've got two projects within SHCF Wave 1. It's part of two different consortiums. So I'm going to touch on some of the information, some of the detail of those projects, but I'm going to keep that fairly high level. Um, and then I'm going to come on to focusing on the learning and what we've learned from, from those two projects and um, how we're feeding that into future waves of SHCF and our retrofit program more generally. So a little bit about Stonewater there. We've got around 35,000 homes. We're a national housing association. Um, we've got quite a wide geographic spread. So if you drew a triangle from Devon across to Eastbourne up to Leeds, that's sort of our operational area, um, but quite a heavy presence along the M4 corridor and south of that. Um, Semi-rural housing association as well. So we've got around 6,000 homes off of the gas grid, which creates us um, some significant challenges. And they tend to be more of our um, lower performing homes from an energy perspective. 
So we're part of two different consortia for SHDF Wave 1 because um, through Wave 1 um, the bids had to be led by a local authority so as a housing association we partnered with um, local authorities that we work within so we're working with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority um, we've got a small projects up there with 31 homes um, solid wall properties and then we're also working with Shropshire, Herefordshire and Telfordshire, uh, Telford councils um, Shropshire are the lead bidder there um, with 37 homes and a different uh, different archetypes within that project so what we tried to do was pick challenging projects that were some of our poorer performing homes but two very different types of projects so that we could learn the most from the two um, so in those homes they're generally off, off the gas grid whereas in the West Yorkshire projects they're on gas grid um, so we're looking at um, the challenges there they generally the two types of archetypes that um, are our lower performing properties from an energy rating. So this is the West Yorkshire project um, and as you can see we've got solid wall stone terrace properties there um, and they're on mixed tenure streets we've got some private homeowners mixed in amongst these properties. Um, not sure who thought it was a good idea to include these in a project that needs to be delivered within 12 months um, but yeah you're looking at him right now so um, <laughs> uh, we like a challenge so this has been a particularly problematic project um, we started surveying ahead of hearing whether we got the funding um, but we're still having issues with planning um, and we're looking at a hybrid approach of internal wall insulation and external wall insulation so we've got some of these properties with um, rendered finish on, on certain elevations so we're looking at how we can do external wall insulation on those elevations but we, are, we have had to submit a change request for this project, so we've been looking at alternative properties that we can put into this SHDF project to be able to deliver our commitment to Bayes in terms of the number of homes brought up to EPC Band C. So we've brought in some cavity wall properties where we're doing heating upgrades and cavity wall insulation alongside that. So we're now delivering more than 31 homes for this project, and around 50% of those 31 homes will also be delivered under the funded programme. The other 50% will continue to deliver and we're working with the retrofit designers at the moment to look at appropriate solutions. Because um, we've engaged these customers, we've got the customers fully engaged within those homes so we don't want to just say actually this is proving too difficult and move on to another property. We've got other homes like this that we will need to deliver in future. So we're working through those challenges at the moment. The alternative projects in Shropshire, Herefordshire, um, all off gas properties. We've got some solid wall homes but generally the majority are, are cavity wall or suspended floors so we're doing wall insulation floor insulation lofts and then um, heating upgrades so low carbon heating in the form of air source heat pumps in most cases that picture you can see there is um, the most challenging property of of the project so that is a solid wall home that's the before and after images that you've got there and that's had pretty much everything we could do done to that home so external wall insulation window upgrades um, had new doors after that photo was taken, solar PV, heating upgrade. Um, so we've spent around £45,000 on that home, bringing that up to standard, but that now meets our net zero standards. We won't have to go back to that home and deliver any more work to that. Um, and that's one of a, a semi-detached properties um, and we don't own the semi-detached home. So again, that creates another challenge. The same with the West Yorkshire scheme. Um, having the private owners, you've got party wall agreements that you need to get in place, so we're working through that at the moment. Um, and if you can't get a party wall agreement, then looking at doing internal wall insulation on the reveals, where you've got that party wall so that you're mitigating any cold bridging. Um, we've also got some planning issues and we came across overhead power cables on some of these properties as well, which creates a real challenge for delivering external wall insulation. If you need to extend the roof eaves um, to bring that out over the external wall insulation if you've got overhead power cables then we're having to engage with um, the network distributors to get permission to move those cables and put them underground so one of the schemes that we're delivering within the Shropshire project um, again we've deferred out of the SHDF projects and brought in other homes to replace that because we're looking at around 50 60 thousand pounds just to relocate those electricity cables without doing any of the other retrofit work um, so that's something we are working through with the network operator, but um, we've had to defer that out of the project so that we can complete this one on time. Um, um, the other benefit from the work we're doing in Shropshire and Herefordshire is we're also retro retrofitting another 160 homes outside of SHDF. 
So we surveyed those properties through July to November 2021, and we're only delivering those this financial year. So it's been a real benefit to have that mix of homes that we're delivering retrofit to because you've got that plan B, so where you come up against difficult measures or difficult properties that you're having to submit change requests for, you've got a ready-made project that you can actually just bring into the programme and still deliver your commitment to Bayes or the Department for Net Zero as they're now, um, now termed. So coming on to key considerations, um, thinking about your intended outcomes early before you even submit a bid um, and even outside of thinking about SHDF, just thinking what are your strategic objectives, what are your long-term targets for your stock and your properties um, and planning your investment around those intended outcomes rather than being distracted by what the funding agreements are, what the rules and requirements are for the properties within that bid. Focus on what you need to deliver and prioritise that and build a a more holistic um, investment programme, looking at all of the capital investment that you need to deliver across your homes. We've got 35,000 homes, around 7,000 homes below a band C, so we've got limited resources to deliver that, so we need to prioritise based on where we're delivering work. Uh, data and retrofit assessments, as Joe mentioned, data is really, really important. Um, we thought our data was in relatively good shape, but actually the, the level of information that you need to deliver retrofit under PAS 2035 is, is immense, and that's not the sort of information that we hold within our asset management system. So getting ahead of yourself, getting out as early as possible and delivering surveys, and also not just accepting that any retrofit assessment is going to cover what you need. Actually, there's a, a lot of additional information that some retrofit assessors won't provide as standard. So things like if you're looking at a solid wall home, identifying is the property next door privately owned, is there overhead power cables, are there any reveals where windows are tight in corners and actually you're not going to be able to open a window if you install external wall insulation. Do meter boxes need moving and are you going to have to engage with energy companies to do that? Because all of those things add to your timeline and your ability to deliver within 12 months as it is in SHDF wave one or, or two and a half years for wave two. And, and if you come up against those issues with overhead power cables, even delivering within two and a half years is going to be a challenge. Um, and that then leads you onto your time scale. So through that really intensive process of gathering data, you can then factor in all of those risks that you've identified on those projects and those schemes. And from there, you can build your program more intelligently and understand actually which properties are more likely to be delivered within the first 12 months and which do you need to maybe put in, put in year two or defer so that you can do all of that preparation work, liaise with the planning authority, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that then brings you on to customer engagement because it's quite a challenge to manage customers' expectations on such a long-term project. You're going in and surveying these homes like we did in July 2021 and we're only actually completing the work to those customers' homes now in, in March 2023. So making that clear to customers that actually there might be another winter to live through in, in their current home before we can design all of these retrofit solutions to make sure we're doing the right thing for the long term is really, really important. Um, otherwise, you just lead yourself down the route of getting complaints or dissatisfaction from customers or them losing faith in the project altogether and then um, suffering with access issues. And finally, having a plan B, like I said, um, having more properties to survey than perhaps you plan to deliver because you're always going to come up against challenges that you didn't expect, certain technical problems or um, planning issues that you're not going to be able to deliver within time. So having those other projects ongoing that you can bring into the programme, again, is really, really useful. And then moving on, thinking about scaling up, we're only delivering sort of 250 homes in the current year, 60-odd of those through SHDF. Um, survey, survey, survey. Again, it comes back to that data, trying to get ahead of yourself and gathering that really detailed information for retrofit. Um, so at the moment, as Joe said, we're not stopping with our, with our Wave 2. We're already on the way doing our retrofit assessments and then lining up the, the retrofit designs for those. As soon as we've got those completed, we'll be issuing another batch of retrofit assessments so that we can start to get one, two, three years ahead of ourselves. And that then really feeds into our holistic investment planning so we can overlay that detailed information with other investment we're making within those homes, thinking about kitchen replacements, bathroom replacements, especially where you've got solid wall properties where you might have to deliver internal wall insulation, bringing all of those programs together so that you're uh, mobilizing your programs efficiently, minimizing your overheads on, on the delivery of those projects um, and minimizing disruption to customers as well so that we're not going back to these homes and also maximizing um, access rates so some customers may be less 
fuss about getting their home insulated are more interested in when they're going to get a new kitchen, but whereas others might be more interested in the windows. So if you're packaging those works together, actually, you're going to get more, hopefully more success rate in accessing those properties. And we're starting to try and look towards a more area-based approach to delivering retrofit. Um, but that all links into the funding as well. We need much more, much more flexible funding packages to be able to work with local authorities and look at these mixed tenure homes so we can deliver retrofit at scale in areas. So looking at those West Yorkshire properties, what we really need is the local authority fully on board, working with a planning authority and also targeting those privately owned homes that we can deliver a street by street approach to really tackle those, those complex homes. So that's where we're trying to engage more with our local authority partners and, and work with combined authorities that we work within. Um, but happy to take any questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam and Ariana and Joanne. Fantastic um, presentations, really interesting insight along the journey of, of, of retrofit and SHDF. Um, there's a few minutes left for questions, so I'd like to open them to the floor in a moment. I just one question I did want to ask Joanne. Um, what happens in the doomsday scenario that there is no SHDF to funding? Can you? Oh, um, so as I said in the beginning, we've had the board and the executive team buy in. So if we don't get the funding, we will still carry on, but we may have to alter our plans a little bit and we may do it just over a slightly longer period. But we're quite lucky that we have got funding available for us. So um, we have done a little bit of the scenario planning already if we don't get the funding. So still guns blazing. Good. Good, good to hear it doesn't end there. Nice. Your hand went up first, sir. So I've got a two-part question, actually. Alex from Bright Green Homes in Brighton. And um, first one is, uh, you mentioned about the range of money that's spent on the houses. How much do you think you're spending on average per property to do reach those targets? And the second question is, are you hiring your own retrofit coordinators in-house or are you using third-party providers? Um, I, I can go first with, so retrofit coordinators, we're outsourcing that. We do have retrofit coordinators in-house, but what we wanted to do is to use those, because um, it's going to be quite intensive, because we've got 600 odd homes to do. So we wanted them to be like the auditing, the retrofitters that were actually um, going out to, actually we're going out this week to sign the contracts on that. Um, the money we're spending, um, I think it's about £20,000 we're aiming on. Um, but for this wave, we're not doing EWI. As soon as you put EWI on, the costs absolutely shoot up. Um, but we haven't got that much um, EWI on this time. And, and Adam, are you outsourcing the sub resource? Yes. Yeah, so um, in the wave one project, we've outsourced that through the contractors we've done almost like a turnkey solution where the contractor provides a retrofit assessments and coordination um, through a third party however wave two we've signed a contract with an external provider of retrofit assessment and coordination we do also have an internal retrofit coordinator but again they're overseeing the project and providing more of a, an audit perspective and sense checking the work that's going on um, and throughout the next two years we'll be upskilling all of our frontline surveyors who deliver our capital work to become either retrofit coordinators or assessors, so we're building that in-house knowledge, but the likelihood is we'll continue to outsource that and just use that internal knowledge to manage the projects. Um, in terms of property values, very much similar, around the £20,000 mark. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last question. I'll hand run up at the back here. Hi, Neil Sefton from Green Oak Housing Association. A question for Adam and for Joanne. Um, in terms of identifying properties, are tenants with right to buy or right to acquire in or out of scope? In terms of homes that are already right to buy and privately owned? Yeah. Can't do now. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah, so already privately owned homes, they're out of scope um, unless where they're in blocks of flats, et cetera, and it's fairly basic measures, then we'll be looking to self-fund the fabric works of that whole block. Um, but as you probably know, under PAS 2035, 
still need to access those properties to make sure we're doing all of the assessments and ventilation checks, etc., for those homes. Um, but in terms of individual street properties, they're out of scope at the moment. That's where we need the more flexible funding to deliver privately owned homes as well. Um, so we're not we're not doing any flats in uh, Wave Two. We're only doing houses. Um, so we haven't got that issue um, with that. If they have the right to buy or right to acquire, then we won't remove them from the program. We will do them anyway um, and just hope they don't put in their right to buy. Um, but you can't ever... They may do that and then you would hope that some of the cost of the house will take into account the measures that you've put in, but you can't stop it. So you could do the works, and then the next day they could then put in their right to buy. We can't stop them doing that. A challenging scenario. Thank you for the questions from the, t um, from the audience. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, round of applause for the panel, please. Enjoy the rest of Future Build.